Greetings, folks. My name is Lucas Mann. I pastor the Spring Church in Lawrence, South Carolina, and I come out here this evening with some friends of mine to preach the gospel of grace to you, to bring to you the message of life, the good news of Jesus Christ, that Christ is King, that He is the Lord, and that He has come to save His people from their sins. As Matthew 1, 21 tells us, my friends, I'm here to, to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, the risen King. He reigns and He rules over the universe, and He works all things according to His divine purpose. We're here to make known the mystery of the Gospel, that Christ died and was buried and was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He has ascended into glory. He has sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. And He lives to make intercession for those who will draw near to God through Him. We're here to make much of sin and to call out sin, yes, to warn you about the wrath of God which is to come. That is true. We are certainly here because we care for your souls. We don't want you to perish in your sins. We want you to be reconciled to God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We want you to go from being the enemy of God to being the friend of God. We want you to go from being the, the child of Satan, the child of the devil, to a child of the Most High God. Friends, we're here to make much of sin, yes, but it is so that we might make much of the Savior. We're here to preach the bad news so that we might offer up the good news of Jesus Christ. To be laid hold of, to be grabbed hold of, for as the Scripture says in John 3.18, He who believes in Him is not judged. And so it is our heart's desire to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. This is ultimately an act of worship unto God, an act of, of praise unto the Creator of all things, the Maker of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. As a friends, we want you to know that we care for you, we care for your soul, we love you, but we also do this out of a love for God. We love our fellow neighbor, we love our fellow man, we also love God. And so therefore, we cannot keep silent. We must share the Gospel with those who are lost. So the text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this evening is found in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 3, in verse 12. And the Apostle Paul is writing here, he is quoting out of the Old Testament, and he simply writes these words. He says, All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. That's the issue I would like to address this evening. That there is not one human being who is morally perfect. There is not one human being who is, in the fullest sense, good. We have corrupted ourselves by our own sin. We have brought upon our own souls ruin because of our transgressions, because of our iniquities. We have been born into sin. We inherited this corrupted nature because of the sin of Adam. Because the first federal head of the human race, Adam, fa failed. He failed to keep the covenant of works. He failed to obey God. And therefore, when he fell, all his posterity fell with him. And all the human race was brought into utter ruin, was brought into hopelessness. There is not one who does good. There's not even one. We would be wise to think low of ourselves and not think high of ourselves. We'd be wise to understand that we are vile wretches. Notice I said we. I'm not exempting myself from this. I know that I'm a vile sinner just as you are. I know that. The text is very exclusive. It says, there is none who does good. There is not a single person that does perfect righteousness. Not a single person who can live in obedience to God perfectly. Not a single person who submits themselves to the decree of God with a perfect intent and with pure motives. 
Many people claim to have good deeds. And it is by those good deeds that they say that they are justified before God. They say that their righteousness is sufficient to bring them unto heaven. But my friends, that is not what the Scriptures say. In Isaiah 40, 64 verse 6, it says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. We would be wise to understand and to submit ourselves to this truth that we all are under the curse of sin. That is why Christ had to come into the world. That is why Jesus had to come to save helpless wretches. He did not come to give the righteous a pat on the back and say, keep on trying, you'll get there one day. Or if you just try your best, God will accept that. No, He came to seek and to save that which was lost, as He Himself said in Luke 19.10. He came to save even His very name, Jesus. It means salvation. Friends, Jesus came to save people who could not save themselves. And these people were not like someone who was drowning in water. No, they are dead in sin. We are all dead in sin by default. As Paul himself wrote in the New Testament in Ephesians 2.1, he told the Christians at Ephesus, he said, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. The sinner has no ounce of spiritual life within himself. That is why God has to grant it to him from on high. That is why the new birth is an imperative. You must, my friends, be born again. The Lord Jesus Christ Himself said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Friends, the only way that you can be born again is by the power of God. That's the only way of salvation. Depravity is so bad. Sin is so bad. The state of man outside of Christ is so bad that it takes a radical work of God upon the heart of that vile wretch. In fact, the Lord Jesus Himself said in Mark chapter 10, He said this concerning salvation. He said in verse 27 of Mark 10, He said, with people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. And that is ultimately the good news, that God did what sinners could not do for themselves, and that is that He sent His Son into the world to save sinners from hell to save those who were lost, who were on the road to destruction, who were on the road to damnation. To save those who could not save themselves. Christ died as a propitiatory sacrifice upon the cross and rose again three days later. And it is ultimately that Gospel that I seek to unpack and to convey, to propound this evening, to bring to your attention and to demand a response to plead with you that you might repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation unto the glory of God. But before we look at these truths concerning man's depravity and ultimately the Gospel itself, I would like us to consider the context of this verse here in Romans chapter 3. In Romans 3 here, Paul is explaining the depravity of all humankind. He says in verse 9, What then? Are we better than they? Now, contextually speaking, he was talking about the Jewish people who in Paul's day, for the most part, had rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, rejected the Gospel. And the question was, we who have accepted Christ, are we better than the unbelieving Jews in Paul's day? And the answer was no. And why is that? Well, he answers the question and in verse 9. He says, not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. My friends, it does not matter the color of your skin or your background or how much money you make or what place you hold in society. All people are equally tainted by sin or equally dead in sin. There is not one better than another or there is not one worse off than another. We are all sinners in the hands of an angry God by default. That's why Paul later on in, in, in this very chapter, in verse 23, could write these words, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is an inclusive phrase that includes every person. 
in every age of this world's existence. And then he continues on in verse 10, he says, As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. So he, he already, right at the outset here, quoting the Old Testament, shows us how lost man truly is. How bad the state is of a sinner who is apart from the saving grace of Christ who finds themselves not in Christ, but outside of Christ. Romans 8.1 says, For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the opposite of that would be, for those who are outside of Christ Jesus, there is condemnation. Friends, if you're outside of Christ, if you have not salvation from the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have not God. You may have the outward trappings of religion, you may have outward performance and deeds, but those will not justify. Those will not save your soul. Friends, you have to embrace Christ. Your hope has to be fully in Christ, fully in the Son of God, who loved sinners so much that He would lay His life down for them. And so that brings to a close there verse 11, and that brings us to the doorstep of verse 12. And verse 12 speaks to the fact that there is none who does good. So let's consider that now. In verse 12, Paul says, God bless you, sir. He says, all have turned aside. What does that mean? What does it mean that all have turned aside? We have turned aside from what? Or from whom specifically? From our Creator. From God Almighty. We see the effect of sin in the world in which we live. It is all around us. It taints family, family members. It taints friendships. It taints society. It taints culture. Friends, even right now in the United States, we live in a culture that is constantly being degraded by various forms of greed and sexual immorality and perversion. That's the effect of sin, my friends. We see it all around us. And truly, therefore, we ought to be able to say in agreement with the Apostle Paul, yes, all have turned aside. We no longer, as Adam and Eve did in the garden, delight in God and, and have communion with Him, but we as fallen human beings turn aside from that which we know to be true. We turn aside from the God whom we know to be real. There is no such thing as an atheist, friends. No such thing. Every person on the face of the earth knows of the existence of God. And they even know some of His attributes as they are revealed in creation, as they are revealed in this world that we live in. The knowledge that we find in creation, however, is not sufficient for salvation. And that is why it pleased God to bring His Holy Scripture about, to bring the Word of God about, that sinners might read it and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. All that is required for salvation is found in the Bible, is found in the Word of God. These 66 books inspired by God. God moved 40 plus authors, 40 plus men to write these 66 books of Holy Scripture. As they were moved by the Holy Spirit, they wrote on three separate continents over a period of 1600 years. And the Bible has wonderful continuity and total agreement in all of its di different parts. Because it all testifies to one singular truth, that God saves sinners. That salvation is from the Lord. That the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the triune God, is working to bring about the salvation of His elect people for His own glory. And so going back to verse 12, after it says all have turned aside, it says together they have become useless. Now it does not mean that they don't do anything useful. It's speaking spiritually. They have no use spiritually because they're dead spiritually. Friends, the walking dead is taking place right now in the sense spiritually. That there are people walking around these streets who are spiritually dead. And they need salvation. They need spiritual life in Jesus Christ. Otherwise, they will experience eternal death. After that, he says, There is none who does good. There is not even one. There is none who does good. Not a single person, my friends, does good in the sight of God. 
Even the things we think to be good, even the good deeds we perform are tainted by wrong, wrong intentions or even bad execution of those various actions. Our, even our good deeds are tainted by the poison of sin. Truly there is none who does good. In fact, the Lord Jesus described the lost in Matthew 7 as workers of iniquity, those who practice lawlessness. Those who practice, make a practice of sinning. What is a doctor? What is a medical doctor? They make a practice of practicing medicine, of trying to heal people and treat their illnesses. And the Bible says that sinners practice lawlessness. They make a lifestyle of it. And friends, if you're living in sin, you are... You are putting your soul at risk eternally. You might be lost. You might be lost in hell forever. It is, it is the call of the Gospel that goes forth this evening that calls you to flee to Christ, to turn from your drunkenness and your drug abuse, to turn from your pride and your greed, your love of money, and embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. And believe upon Him alone. Otherwise, you will be lost. If I saw you walking down the street about to step into a burning building at any moment which was going to collapse and kill you, the most loving thing that I could do is warn you, is cry out to you and plead with you that you not run into the building. You may be offended, you may be upset with me, but I must call out to you. I must plead with you that you not put your life in danger. How much more? If I believe the Bible to be true, and I believe that hell is a real place, and Scripture says many are going there, how much more loving would it be that I not warn you? It would be a hate-filled thing for me to hold back the truth of the Gospel, to not warn you, to not plead with you. Christ bore the wrath of God. Christ bore the wrath of God for His people. And His people's sins have been paid for. Amen. And you want to know, how am I? how do I know if I'm one of these people? Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And then the last phrase found in verse 12, there is not even one. It's as if the first phrase he gave wasn't enough and there had to be more tacked on to the end there. That it's not just that there's none who does good, there's not even one. He wants to be thorough in covering the bad news. But ultimately, we ask ourselves, okay, what is the standard of goodness? What is the standard of righteousness? The standard of righteousness, the standard of goodness is the character of God. Is the perfect, holy character of God. And therefore, we find ourselves asking a very important question. Who is God? Who made me? Well, God is triune. God is three eternal persons co-eternal, co-existent, yet one being essence in nature, yet that, that essence in nature and being not divided. God is holy. God is separated from that which is evil and perverse. That's why in Isaiah 6, the prophet Isaiah, when he was granted the heavenly vision, found himself in the throne room in heaven, saw the angels there, crying out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Uh, sure, ma'am. Absolutely. Yep. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. For Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Good day. Thank you. Robert. Thank you. God bless you, ma'am. Oh, you can you can continue on um, listening if you'd like. Yes. You can continue. Uh, well, here my friend Laura would love to. I'm going to continue to preach. No, absolutely. You're fine. Here's here's my friend Laura right there. Mm. Mm. Excuse me for that interruption, friends. So the character of God. God is holy, set apart from that which is wicked and evil. God is also just. God is also just. He's a just judge. As, as the book of Psalm tells us, Psalm 119, 137 says, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. God is righteous in all His ways, in all His dealings with the children of men, my friends. We must understand this. We must grasp this. It is true that God is gracious and kind. He abounds in loving kindness towards sinners. 
We see even in Scripture it says God is patient with the wicked. He's bearing with the wicked, giving them time to repent and embrace Christ. That is true. That is very true. In fact, uh, 1 John 4, 8 tells us God is love. God is the personification of love. He is what love is. But these attributes of God, God's love and grace and mercy, do not cancel out His holiness, do not cancel out His justice and His righteousness. My friends, the attributes of God do not do such. God is not self-contradicting. Absolutely not. In all His ways, He is perfect. In fact, in Exodus 34, verse 6, it says this concerning God. God is speaking here to Moses. He says, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. But listen to verse 7. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands. Who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. My friends, God's attributes of grace and love and mercy do not cancel out His holiness and His justice and His righteousness, His righteous wrath that is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. The sinner is not neutral toward God and God is not neutral toward the sinner. There is wrath, my friends, wrath that is revealed from heaven. You must understand this about you. If you are outside of Christ, if you know not sal the salvation from Christ, the wrath of God abides on you. That is why you must come to Christ. Scripture exhorts those who read it to fear God, to fear the Lord. There is a healthy fear of God that all people ought to have. I fear fire. I'm not going to go run into a bonfire. I respect it and it provides heat. But my friends, I'm not going to go run through a bonfire. I respect it. I fear fire. And how much more should we fear God? Who is, as Deuteronomy 4.24 says, a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. He is jealous for justice to be done in the earth, my friends. And so, we find ourselves standing before this holy God. The righteous God of glory. But I also want you to understand something else, my friends. God has not only in an abstract sense told us that He is holy and just, He has put His holiness on display. He has defined His holiness in His law. When we consider the Ten Commandments, which are the moral law of God, we find the holy character of God brought forth. We find the holy character of God unveiled for us to see. The law of God is like a mirror. It reflects to us the character of God. We find in the book of Mark, in Mark chapter 10, where the Lord Jesus is speaking to the rich young ruler, we find Jesus actually recalls some of the Ten Commandments. He says in verse 19 of Mark 10, Jesus is speaking to the rich young ruler. He says, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. A couple other commands God gave is do not blaspheme and do not idolize. Do not worship false gods. Do not worship anything else besides the true God. These commands show us the character of God. We look at the first one, do not murder. God is not a murderous God and therefore He commands that people not murder one another. Do not commit adultery. Why does God want spouses to be faithful to one another? Because God is a perfect, faithful, covenant-keeping God and His promises will not fail. And therefore, when a husband and wife enter into covenant and they enter into that promise with one another, it is not to be broken. Do not steal. Certainly, God owns all things. He has prerogative to tell us what we ought to do with that which He owns. Do not bear false witness. Do not lie, in other words. Why does God command that? Because God is not a liar. The book of Hebrews tells us what? That it is impossible for God to lie. It is an impossibility for God to lie. 
But also the law of God not only shows us that, but something else. It is our character in light of the character of God. That is the measure of goodness, my friends. It is the character of God as it is revealed in the law of God. That is the measure of what is right and wrong. And therefore, when we look into this mirror, we see the filth that covers our souls. We see that we are covered in the filthy dirt of sin. For we look at the command, do not murder. And you say, I've never murdered. However, I would ask you to consider what Jesus said in Matthew 5. He said, if you have anger in your heart towards someone else, an unjustified anger, that it is the same as murder. So my friends, if you have that, if you've ever had that in your heart, then you have murdered. God sees you as a murderer. Do not commit adultery. And you say, I've always been faithful to my spouse. Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you look at a woman with lust, you commit adultery already with her in your heart. If you go watch football and you look at those cheerleaders inappropriately, you've committed adultery in your heart. And this, this goes for you women as well. If you look at a man inappropriately and lustfully, that's adultery. My friends, God sees the mind. He sees the heart. He sees what we think. He even sees the intent of the heart. And you know what Genesis 6, 5 tells us? That God saw that every intent of the thought, of the intent of the heart of man was only to do evil continually because man loves sin. Do not steal. Have you ever stolen something? You're a thief. You're guilty before God, my friends. Do not bear false witness. Have you ever lied? You know what the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation? All liars will have their place in the lake of fire. Friends, I encourage you and I plead with you to repent and believe upon Christ. To embrace Christ Jesus. To believe the gospel that Jesus died on behalf of sinners and was buried and was raised on the third day. And that all who come unto Him will receive eternal life. Will receive forgiveness of their sins. So therefore, we find ourselves as sinners before God, as lawbreakers, as murderers, as thieves, as liars, as adulterers. And that is only a few of the Ten Commandments. There's more we could consider. So therefore, we are condemned. We are judged by the law. And just as a guilty convicted murderer here in Greenville, South Carolina, deserves to be punished for their lawbreaking, so too it is with those who have broken the law of God. So too it is with those who have trampled God's commands underfoot. They deserve the just penalty of the law. And the penalty for sin is hell. It's the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place of torment for the ungodly. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, 46, He said concerning the wicked, These will go away into eternal punishment. Hell never ends, my friends. The torment of those who are in hell will never stop because they've offended an infinitely holy and an infinitely just God. In fact, the Lord Jesus Himself said concerning hell these words in Mark chapter 9, verse 47. He said, If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out, for it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell. Verse 48, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And so we are, to the fullest extent, hopeless, helpless, and depraved, defiled, wretched, and wicked, and lost. And we have no hope in and of ourselves. There's no amount of good deeds that can make you or me right. Think about the foolishness of a murderer, a convicted murderer here in Greenville County trying to argue his own righteousness to get him out of the courtroom, to escape the penalty of the law. It doesn't work. My friends, it is the same way with God. Trying to argue for our own goodness does not remove our evil deeds. They're still there. I'm not saying don't do good things. We, sure, we certainly sh should, but those will not save us. Those will not justify us, and they will not bring a soul to heaven. In fact, it offends God. It's an offense to God when we try to offer up our good deeds to save us. Imagine a judge hearing that from the mouth of a rapist. A rapist, convicted rapist, saying to the judge, Judge, listen, I am all for women. I've repented of rape. I'll never rape a woman again. 
and I'm a good guy. I'm going to give to charity. I'm going to do these good things. He's going to say, that's great, but you've broken the law and you deserve the penalty. My friends, it is the same way with God, only more so. God will see to it that the law is appeased. And so we are without hope. Order! However, friends, if Christ had not come, then we would be left in the state of hopelessness. But Christ Himself is the good news. Jesus Christ is the Gospel Himself. Jesus saves sinners. Galatians 4.4 4 says that when the fullness of the times came, God sent forth His Son. The Lord Jesus Christ came down, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal God, came down and took upon Himself human flesh and was born of a virgin. He was born under the law. Under the law of God which we broke, He came and lived under it and fulfilled it. Those 30 plus years of silence, which we do not have much record of in the New Testament, what was Jesus doing? He was fulfilling the law of God. He lived in perfect submission to all the commands that God wrote in the Old Testament. That is why the Lord Jesus Himself said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, He said, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And let me tell you something, friends. Christ fulfilled the law of God to the uttermost. In fact, we find in two chapters back in Matthew 3, that the Father speaks audibly from heaven at the baptism of Jesus and He says, This is My beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so here we find the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect man, fully God, truly God, truly man, and He's fulfilled the law, and then something glorious happens out of His great love for His church, out of a great love for His bride, out of a great love for His people. Christ died for sinners. Jesus Christ willingly laid aside His privileges. He limited Himself and He laid Himself down as a suffering servant to bear the wrath of Almighty God against the sins of the people of God. And so He was beat, He was whipped, He was spat upon, He was made a public mockery. Even His own disciples who dearly loved Him at that time of fear, they left, they fled. And so Christ here alone is suffering and He is nailed to a cross there and on those, in those few hours some 2,000 years ago outside of Jerusalem and Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ hung upon the cross as the Lamb of God. And on that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Upon the cross of Calvary, the Lord Jesus Christ received into Himself the wrath of God. And friends, I plead with you to flee to Him. To flee to Christ as your only hope. He is your only hope for eternal salvation. Acts 4.12 tells us there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. Listen to how Isaiah 53 describes the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4 it says, Surely our griefs He Himself bore and our sorrows He carried, yet we ourselves have seen Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him and by His scourging we are healed. And then in verse 10 we find one of the most precious phrases in all the Bible. It says, But the Lord was pleased to crush Him. The Father was pleased in the death of His Son. The Father unleashed upon His Son the full fury of His wrath against sin so that sinners could walk free. And that God could be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What is hell, my friends? Hell is God unleashing His wrath upon the wicked. And what is the cross of Calvary? It is God the Father unleashing upon Christ the full weight of His wrath so that sinners would not have to burn in hell eternally. Jesus, the Son of God, satisfied the wrath of God. There's not an ounce left he died upon that cross for every last one of His people. And so He cries out of that cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani, that is my God, my God, why have You forsaken me? 
He's bearing the wrath of God. And then at that moment, in as it says in John chapter 19, that moment of death, He cries out to tell us die one word. And it means it is finished. The wrath of God was spent. It was gone. The, the, the fine has been paid for. The bail has been put away. And so God can legally dismiss the case of His people. God could legally let His people off the hook. And so we find not only did Jesus die, but He was raised on the third day. The Father rose Him up as a public display that He had received His his sacrifice upon the cross as a sufficient payment for the sins of the people of God. The resurrection of Christ has significant meaning because the Father is in effect saying, yes, I receive the sacrifice of my Son and I raise Him up on the third day as the evidence that I have received it as sufficient payment for the sins of my people. Christ is alive and death will no longer have power over Him. Scripture says He will never die again. He will never die again. After 40 days of further ministry among His disciples, Christ Jesus then, after having been raised from the dead, went to the top of the Mount of Olives there in Jerusalem, excuse me, right outside of Jerusalem, and then bodily ascended into glory. He bodily ascended into heaven. And Scripture says in the book of Hebrews that He went into heaven. It says in verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 1, it says, and He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. When He had made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Christ sat down. High priests in the Old Testament were never supposed to sit down. In fact, in the temple in Israel, the first and second temple, the, there was nowhere to sit down. There was nowhere for the priests to rest. That was because their work was continual. Over and over and over did they have to sacrifice animals day after day, year after year. But Christ comes in as high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek and He lays down His life as a ransom for many and He sits down. Something a high priest was never supposed to do because Jesus Christ's work is finished. He is King and He is Lord and He reigns as the King of glory. My friends, away with the Roman Catholic idea that Jesus is re-sacrificed re through the Mass. No, He's not. Jesus' work at the cross is sufficient and it is done. The work of salvation is complete. It is over. It is finished. So the call of the Gospel, my friends, is this. The call of the Gospel, as Jesus said in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, is that a sinner must repent and believe in the Gospel. Repentance and faith is the right posture that a sinner ought to have before God. Repentance is a, someone realizing their sin, realizing their depravity, realizing their bankruptcy, realizing that they're going to go to hell for their sins and they need a Savior. And it is a resolve to flee sin. It is a resolve to turn from sin, to turn from pornography, and to turn from drunkenness, and to turn from pride, and to turn from self-righteousness, and to turn to the Son of God for life. And then, of course, the second thing which goes right in hand with repentance, and that is faith, or belief as the New Testament sometimes calls it. Belief in the Gospel. That is that you take God at His Word. You take God at His Word concerning what He has said about the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness as Genesis 15, 6 tells us and as Paul wrote later on in Romans chapter 4, verse 3. My friends, you must believe that Jesus Christ died and was buried and was raised on the third day for you. Salvation is a personal thing. Saving faith is a personal thing. It's personal. We believe that Jesus died for us. He personally died for me and my sin. That is the proper response to the Gospel. And ultimately, that is only granted by the grace of God. Ultimately, that is an evangelical grace that is given by the power of the Spirit of God. It's not something that man can muster up. It is something that God grants to man. That's why in Ephesians 2 it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Faith is the gift of God, my friends. Repentance, as 2 Timothy 2.25 tells us, is granted by God. 
And here's the promise of the Gospel. Here's the promise of the good news of Jesus Christ to sinners who will repent and believe it. The Father will forgive them of all sin, past, present, and future. All of their iniquities, God bless you, sir. All of their sins will be forgiven. Past, present, and future. Gone because Jesus has already paid for it. God can now be just and the justifier. God can now be holy and gracious. God can now be righteous and loving. See, that's the beauty of the Gospel. That the attributes of God come together in beautiful harmony so that God can be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So not only will they receive forgiveness of sin, but the Father will credit to the sinner the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that if you repent and believe on Christ, God not only forgives you of your sin, but He looks upon you as if you lived Jesus' life, as if you performed as well as Jesus did, as if you loved your neighbor as yourself as Jesus did, as if you loved the Lord your God as Jesus did. The righteousness of Christ, the perfect garment of Christ's righteousness is given to poor sinners that they might be rich spiritually. Many people are pursuing wealth in this world, my friends. But we ought to pursue spiritual wealth. We ought to pursue the riches that are found in Jesus Christ. Friends, repent and believe the gospel of grace. Embrace the Lord Christ. Embrace Him and bow the knee in submission and in rebellion. Or in submission, turning from your rebellion. Turning to Christ for life. So the Father forgives their sin and credits them with the righteousness of Christ. Jesus takes my sin, I get His righteousness. Jesus takes my filth, I receive His perfect garment of righteousness. That is the great exchange of the Gospel, friends. That's the glory and the beauty of the Gospel that God accomplishes salvation single-handedly apart from the work of man. It is not half man, half God, or 99% God, 1% man. It is 100% of God. And so, therefore, the sinner is justified. Now made holy. Now regarded as holy in the, in the sight of God. Praise be to God that He would do this out of His grace. Salvation is of the free grace of God. Do not listen to the Mormons. Do not listen to Jehovah's Witnesses. Listen to the Bible. The Bible says salvation is by the free grace of God. And grace means unmerited favor. It means that you receive favor that you did not work for. Favor from someone that you did not earn. And friends, that is the beauty of salvation. That it is all of grace. Sovereign grace. And in these closing moments, I want to address a very important issue. A very, very important issue concerning salvation. And it is this, Jesus said in Matthew 7 that there are many on the day of judgment who will look to Christ and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these great things? And He, he says He will say to them, depart from Me, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. There are many who sit in churches and say they're Christians who are going to hell and will be lost. There are many in churches who are going to go to hell. Most people who go to church are going to hell, friends. It's because they say they have Christ, but they do not have Him inwardly. They have an outward appearance of salvation, but inwardly they do not have the reality of it. Listen to what the book of 1 John says. 1 John chapter 2 says in verse 3, By this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him, and does not keep His commandments, is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word, in him the love of God has been truly perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. The one who says He abides in Him, ought Himself to in the same manner as, excuse me, ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. In other words, if you say you have Christ but you do not live for Christ, it's because you're a hypocrite and you're lost. If you say you have Christ and you live for Christ, then you truly do have him. God has truly done a work in your heart. I lived as a false convert for eight years. Eight years of my life, I said I was a Christian, but I was lost. Eight years of my life, 
I walked around and telling people I was converted, but I was a hypocrite. Eight years, my friends, drunkenness, drug abuse, sexual morality, addiction to pornography, watching things God hates on television. And I thought because I prayed a prayer and asked Jesus into my heart that I was converted. I was lost and a hypocrite. There are many who have walked aisles, who have said prayers, who have raised their hands at an evangelistic meeting, whose pastors have told them they were saved, who are lost. You want to know if you know Christ, look at the way you live. Imagine if I was married and I told my wife that I loved her and I went around town sleeping with every other woman in town. Would I love her? I would be a liar. I would be a hypocrite. And yet people say they know Christ and they live as though He never gave them a law to obey. They live as though He never even existed. They live as atheists practically. Such people are lost, lost, lost. And pastors won't tell people this because they're afraid of losing their congregations. Friends, Many are on the road to destruction. Examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. Examine yourselves. Look at your life. Look at your actions. That is how you'll know whether you're in Christ. Salvation is by the free grace of God, but it is evidenced by your work. It is evidenced by your performance. It's not caused by your work, but your work evidences the fact that God has done a work in your heart. Friends, Many on the day of judgment will be turned away from the kingdom of God. Jesus said in Matthew 7 20, so then you will know them by their fruits. I will know whether you're a true Christian and you'll know whether you're a true Christian by the way you walk, think, and talk. What does your mind most dwell upon? What does your heart cling to? That is your God. That is your idol. That is what you worship. It's not what you say you worship. It's what you actually worship. That is what you worship. Is it money? Is it sports? Is it cars? Is it women? Is it beauty? Is it fashion? What is it, my friends? Examine yourselves. All of you who name the name of Christ, look at yourselves and see whether you know Christ at all. Let all who name the name of Jesus Christ depart from evil. Religious hypocrites, false Christians, drag the name of Jesus Christ through the mud. Through the mud. You who say you know Christ but do not live for Him, stop saying you're a Christian, stop claiming the name of Christ, and stop dragging it through the mud. Please, my friends, you who've grown up in Southern Baptist churches, repent and believe the Gospel. You who've grown up in Presbyterian circles, repent and believe the Gospel. You who've grown up in Mennonite churches, repent and believe the Gospel. You pastors and deacons, repent and believe the Gospel. The call is the same. I want to say this also, the Gospel is for the Christian. If any Christians are out here, true Christians, truly converted Christians, I want to encourage you very briefly, rest upon the Gospel, feed upon the Gospel, and preach the Gospel. It's the daily Gospel. It's the manna from heaven that God has provided for us to feast upon. It is spiritual nourishment. It is food. My friend, spiritual food. The Christian is to dwell upon the Gospel truth day after day after day after day, minute by minute. The second the Christian departs from the Gospel, they have departed from the faith. We must be grounded in the Gospel, brethren. Preach it. Preach it with fervor and zeal and passion. As if souls' uh, eternity depended on it, because they do. People's eternal soul does depend upon whether or not they have been truly saved or not. It is all by grace. All by free grace. Grace! Grace, grace, and true grace saves a sinner from the power of sin in their life. Why is it of grace? Well, in closing, I'll say this. Because God is jealous for the glory. God is jealous to bring His name glory and His name praise and His own name honor. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is working all things for His own glory. I love what Paul said in Romans chapter 11. After thoroughly treating the issue of salvation and divine sovereignty over salvation, he writes in verse 33, 
Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became His counselor? Or who was first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. Amen and amen. You who are lost, run to Jesus Christ. Repent and believe the Gospel. You who say you're religious, examine yourself to see whether you know Christ or not. If you do, be encouraged. And if not, repent and believe. And my fellow saints, share the Gospel. Share it, my friends. Share it by the grace of God for the glory of God. For time is ticking away. Souls are perishing. 150,000 people die every day, my friends. Today could be your day. And you'll stand before God. Embrace Christ so that when you stand before God, you are wrapped in a justitia alienum, a foreign righteousness, so that God sees you as perfect in His sight, not because you did anything, but because Christ did it all. So in conclusion, we've seen here in Romans chapter 3, in verse 12, that there is not one who does good. There is not even one. We've seen that we have fallen short of the perfect holy character of God. That we've broken the law of God. All mankind, we deserve hell for our sin. We deserve to be thrown into the place of torment and agony for the wicked. Yet Christ died for His people. He bore the wrath of God for His people and rose again three days later. And all who repent and believe upon Him will be saved. All who embrace Christ will be redeemed. And we've seen that the one who is truly saved will bear fruit of that. And bear fruit of that genuine conversion that God has wrought in their heart. We've seen that this gospel is not only for the lost, but for the saved. For the genuine child of God to feast upon. We've seen that it is all by grace, so that God gets all glory. So that God gets every ounce of glory. So to the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to Him be glory and honor and praise in all things in your life and in mine forever and ever. Amen and amen.